just be a minute more as we get soft ice running, a couple things like that. Get our presentation set up. Please bear with us. The presentation was originally developed for an hour and 30 minutes. However, this time slot's an hour and 50. I mean, 50 minutes, and we've already filled like seven. Therefore, we may run a little bit late. Um, if you need to leave, feel free. However, I will blow through the first 20 slides in about two minutes uh, because we don't have time to get them in. And Sherry does the real interesting slides, so I will introduce her soon. My name is Jamie Butler. I'm from WeKit.com. This is Sherry Sparks, and uh, we developed a project called Shadow Walker, and it's to hide root kits. You can find a um, description of this talk probably later on rootkit.com. Some of the source code I believe shares will post it. Also, it will be in uh, FRAC 63. That, If it hasn't appeared online already, probably in the next week or two, it will be there. If you don't understand much about rootkits or you are new to the Windows world of rootkits, you can go to rootkit.com. We um, post it there for free. Uh, there's a lot of source code for free. Um, nothing there is or you can uh, buy the book Rootkit, uh, Rootkit Subverting the Windows Kernel uh, by Greg Hoagland and myself. So we'll get started with Shadow Walker. <coughs> so quick blow through Rootkits. They don't propagate themselves, they're not like a virus, they're just here to provide stuff. So the attacker gets on the box and they try to maintain presence. They don't want to keep using their zero day to come back all the time to the machine, so they install a rootkit. A rootkit is there to hide their, their presence and also to give them future access at a later date. Rootkits could also be used for law enforcement for things like a sneak and peek or a properly executed search warrant and so forth. There's two levels of protection within the Windows and Linux operating system. There's basically two rings, ring zero and ring four, or three. Ring three is user land uh, processes, they are unprivileged. Ring zero is kernel land. Once you're in ring zero, your kernel rootkit can do whatever you want. Operating system provides uh, basically um, an intermediary between upper level user processes and things that they want to query the operating system for. So I want to open a port. The operating system does that for you and then hands it back to the user land process. They also um, provide an interface between user land processes and the lower hardware. So if you have a ring zero kernel rootkit, you are just like the operating system, you are a man in the middle. Some of the different uh, OS components that a rootkit may want to attack would be the I.O. manager, you can install key loggers, uh, Sherry has a project on rootkit.com, that's a key uh, keyboard sniffer. And you can also attack the file system. You can write your own file filter driver and interface between every single access of the hard drive. Um, the object manager has things like processes and threads um, that it uses to keep uh, bookkeeping. And you can use attack the object manager in order to hide your processes and threads. That's about enough of that. Configuration manager, you can use that to hide registry keys. So first generation rootkits, what were they? These were simple Trojanized uh, replacement programs on the hard drive. They may be, um, may include the Unix login program, LS, PS, so on and so forth. Second generation rootkits, these started to get more, to be more sophisticated. These modified static tables within the uh, kernel or within the upper levels of the operating system themselves. So you can replace the import address table of a PE file and alter the execution path of um, any command. You can also alter the system call table within the kernel at uh, ring zero and change what function actually gets executed within the kernel when the user requests something. Third generation rootkits, um, we, we term these uh, they're, they use DCOM, direct kernel object manipulation. These actually don't hook anything because hooks are a bit easier to detect. Third generation actually manipulate the data structures in memory. So there's no code off 
uh, you don't alter the code at all, you just alter the data structures themselves. This is almost undetectable. Data structures come and go very frequently and they're constantly changing. That's why they're in the data section. Um, this is very hard to detect, and we'll talk about how you can use this to hide processes and threads if you want it. Or you can even use it to hide drivers, escalate uh, process privileges using tokens, etc. So real quick, uh, about two years ago at one of the Black Hats, and all the slides are online, you can see uh, process hiding with DCOM. I also mentioned a little bit last year in my talk about Vice. What the kernel uses to keep track of all the processes is this uh, list of active processes. Um, every e-process block you see there represents an individual process in the system. This individual process could be your little hacker program. It's doing things and you don't want the system administrator to know you're there. If you simply unlink, at the bottom of the slide you see that there's a series of links. If you simply unlink the process that you want to have hidden, it will disappear when you try to list it out. So when you run task manager, etc., it won't be there. Now, current rootkit detection methods, uh, there's basically four types. You don't have time to go into all these, but uh, just quickly, behavioral, integrity, signature-based, and difference-based. Some of your uh, AV products are basically example of signature-based. Integrity checkers, such as Tripwire, check some of the disk files so that if you replace it with Trojan, you'll be found. Different based approaches is kind of a new thing. Microsoft's doing it, F-Secure is doing it, Sys Internals. What this is, is it does some kind of low-level scan within the kernel by following structure directly. It tries to get a list of things like files and processes, registry keys, etc. Then it does an upper-level API call. If there's a difference, you know something's up. Um, behavioral detection. In this, you try to detect the presence, the effects of a rootkit. So you might want to look for alteration in the execution path or what is actually executed within the program. So like system calls or their ordering and so forth. We don't have what, time to go into more of that. Integrity checking, exactly. It's a CRC. This could be on disk or in memory. However, hardly anyone is doing it in memory. Signature based, you scan memory or on disk for um, a particular set of bytes that represents the mal code. So, we have a really powerful way to hide rootkit, or hide processes, etc., within the kernel by modifying all these data structures. However, if you look for our driver, because we are in the kernel, so we have a, a kernel-level uh, driver, you can just do a simple scan, like a signature scan, uh, for the presence of the malware. And that's not very uh, good. So what we want to do is to try to shake it up. So even if you scan memory, you can't detect um, all that decom stuff is in the FU rootkit. Uh, you can download it. But we want to make it so you can't detect our rootkit within the kernel. So this is a, a problem that viruses have faced for a long time. And they use things like polymorphism and stuff to get around it. However, in the kernel, it gets more problematic to do really good polymorphism code. Also, um, no one's doing it other than uh, Holy Father and then ha in his hacker defender. And you have to get him to handhold that. And I think it's like 40 euros every time he does it. So, really quickly, we're going to walk through how we would have this in memory and share it with you both. Jamie. Um, I'm going to be discussing the, uh, the technical implementation of Shadow Walker, which is our rootkit um, hiding technology. Uh, like Jamie said, um, polymorphism has not really been seen a lot in rootkits so far, but it's not really an optimal approach for a rootkit. Um, viruses need to hide their code. Um, rootkits not only need to hide their code, but they also need to hide changes to, um, to operating system components. Um, polymorphism is not necessarily an optimal solution for that when you consider that you have the memory-based equivalents of, uh, say, tripwire or um, other types of integrity checkers. Um, so basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out a way to, um, to hide in memory such that we actually 
took the memory of the system without actually changing the code at all. Um, and that gave rise to, uh, to Shadow Walker, which uh, we're coining kind of as a prototype for the fourth generation in rootkit technology. Um, basically, the alternative to polymorphism is virtual memory subversion. Um, basically, what we're going to be showing you today is a proof of concept demonstration that a rootkit is capable of transparently controlling the view of memory seen by user applications, um, kernel drivers, and the operating system itself. Now, the cool thing about this technology is the fact that there's a minimal performance impact. Um, because we exploit some features in the hardware, um, that means that basically our um, memory hook engine hiding a rootkit is um, virtually undetectable. It has no slowdown or system performance hit. Obviously, this makes this uh, type of technology attractive to not only a rootkit, but also to maybe a virus or a worm or um, spyware applications. Um, the, just a few implications of virtual memory subversion. Um, for a long time, um, rootkit scanners relied upon the integrity of the operating system API. Um, like Jamie mentioned, ever since the second generation rootkits, um, rootkits have been hooking the API, and upper level processes can no longer trust the uh, results returned to them by the API, either the user level API or the kernel level API, depending upon where the rootkit is hooking. Um, so basically, uh, rootkit scanners have gotten a little bit smarter. They're starting to realize that they can't, they can't rely upon operating system APIs anymore. But even those rootkit scanners that don't rely upon operating system APIs, they still rely upon the integrity of the virtual memory system. So therefore, when a security scanner does a read of a certain memory address, it expects to see the data that's actually stored at that address. Um, what we're proposing is actually to return some data that is, in fact, not actually stored at that address. Um, so basically, there are two implications here. Um, if we can control a scanner's memory reads, then we can pull signature scanners and potentially make a known rootkit or virus um, code immune to an in-memory signature scan. Because basically, the scanner will access the range of memory where the rootkit code is stored, and it will be returned data which is a clean copy or um, not, does not have the rootkit code. Um, we can also pull integrity checkers. Um, those kind of checkers, like uh, Jamie Butler um, presented a talk on a tool called Vice, which basically attempts to detect hooks. Um, hooks typically work by replacing the, uh, the beginning of the function prologue in an API with a jump instruction to a, a stub, which is, uh, which is the rootkit code. So basically, normal, under normal situations, a, um, you would not expect to see the first instruction in an API to be a jump instruction. The normal code would be such stuff as stack setup code, um, allocation of local variables. Um, so basically, Jamie uses um, heuristics like this to determine if functions are hooked. Um, basically, the implications for this is that if we are subverting that particular function in memory, um, the, the scanner would perform a read, and it would receive a clean copy of that API function code, yet the actual code that is executing is actually the hook code. Since we're going to be talking about the subversion of virtual memory, um, we're going to need to do a little bit of a review. Um, this is stuff that's normally covered in a uh, college-level operating systems class, but I know that for most people, um, we probably need to review some of this stuff. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the virtual address space layout, and then we're going to talk about some of the concepts of virtual memory. We're going to go over the ideas of paging and segmentation, um, page tables and PTEs, um, how virtual to physical address translation actually occurs, um, what the page fault handler does, and then um, some performance issues associated with paging and how those are actually mitigated using a hardware solution or the translation look-aside buffer. Um, finally, we'll talk about different memory access types and some little uh, eccentricities with the x86 architecture. Um, so basically what you have here is a layout of the most common, um, the two most common layouts for the uh, Windows virtual address space. Um, the first one breaks the virtual address space up into two main components. Um, like Jamie said, we have um, two modes of operation under Windows. We have
have a privileged mode, which is basically kernel land, and we have a non-privileged mode, which is basically user land. Uh, the memory address space is arranged similarly to that. Um, the lower two gigabytes correspond to user land address space. Um, that's going to contain your application code, um, DLL code. Um, the upper two gigabytes is going to be where the operating system kernel is. Um, in the upper two gigabytes, you're going to have NTOS kernel, PAL hardware abstraction layer, boot drivers. Um, you're going to have key operating system structures, um, the, uh, the process objects that uh, Jamie was talking about, um, process page tables, and then um, non-page pool and, uh, and cache memory. Alternatively, we have a uh, second address space layout, which has been used on some of the uh, server 2003 systems, which actually allows you to expand the user address space up to 3 gigabytes. Um, by far the most common um, layout is going to be the one where it's split in half. So basically, um, what is the main idea behind virtual memory? Um, basically, the idea is we want to separate the virtual from the physical address spaces or separate the virtual and physical address spaces. Um, by that, um, what I mean is the virtual address space, is the size of it is going to be defined by the size of your, or the width of your memory bus. So if you have a 32-bit system, that means that you have the ability to address 2 to the 32, or approximately 4 gigabytes of contiguous memory locations. Um, so therefore, your virtual address space spans from 0 up to 4 gigabytes. Um, in contrast, most of us don't really have 4 gigabytes of RAM installed on our system unless we're really lucky. Um, so therefore, we can say that our physical address space is um, constrained by the amount of RAM on our system. Um, and the amount of RAM is most likely going to be less than the 4 gigabyte limit for the, uh, for the virtual address space. So basically, um, virtual memory concerns managing these virtual and physical address spaces by dividing them into fixed size blocks. If those blocks are all the same size, we have a paging architecture. If those blocks may be variable sizes, it's a segmentation architecture. Um, the x86 architecture is actually a combination of segmentation and paging. However, um, for the purposes of our talk, we're focusing upon the paging architecture because that's the level that we're going to subvert. Um, as far as how this map, there's, there's actually mapping information that actually maps a virtual block to a physical block. And the OS is what actually maintains this mapping information and determines which virtual blocks map to which physical blocks. Um, like I said before, the virtual address space may be larger than the physical address space. And also because the OS is managing this mapping, um, virtually contiguous memory blocks do not need to be physically contiguous. Um, this actually shows an illustration of, of those two points on the previous slide. As you can see, we have our virtual address space divided up into blocks. Um, under a paging architecture, we call these blocks pages. Uh, the physical address space is smaller than the virtual address space. It's also divided into fixed size blocks. This is termed frames. Um, basically, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the virtually contiguous blocks do not necessarily have to be physically contiguous. So what, how, what actually maintains this mapping information that the OS uses? Um, this mapping information is contained in page tables. And page tables consist of entries called PTEs, um, or page table entries. Page table entries um, contain at least two pieces of useful information. Um, they contain status information, and they contain mapping information. Um, the page frame number bits are the bits that actually describe what, where that page actually maps to in physical memory. Um, there are also a bunch of status bits, as you can see. Um, a few of the most important ones would be the, uh, the V there for valid. Um, that's going to determine if the page is actually resident in memory or if it's been paged out to the disk. Um, you have the writable bit, which is going to be concerned with protection, whether or not that page is read-only, or whether it's going to be writable as well. Um, you also have some bits, um, the cache disabled, the dirty bit, um, these are bits that the operating system uses um, in its virtual memory management for page swapping and such. Um, and then the last bit of kind of, of interest is going to be the global bit. Um, the global bit is interesting because it determines whether or not this particular mapping information will be flushed from the hardware cache on a context switch. Um, 
Um, this actually becomes important later on. So um, basically, here's, a, here's an illustration of the big picture just to kind of summarize all these ideas. Um, we have our virtual address space layout um, divided into uh, user space and kernel space. Um, we have our pages, um, which are the divisions of the virtual address space. Um, we have process page tables located in, um, in the kernel memory section. Process page tables contain PTEs, which contain status information and mapping information, um, which will basically uh, say where those pages are located out in physical memory. So how do you go from an address to actually figuring out where that particular page um, is in the page table? Um, basically, virtual addresses can encode the information um, necessary to index into page tables. Um, page tables may actually be single level or multi-level. Um, the x86 maintains a two-level paging architecture. Um, basically, we divide the virtual address into two pieces. We're going to divide it into the virtual page number, which is going to contain the page table indexing information, and we divide it into the byte index, which is going to contain an offset to the um, to, from the physical frame in, in uh, physical memory. Um, so basically, the virtual page number, in this case, since we have a two-level architecture, basically what that means is not only do we have a page, page table, we also have a page directory. And basically, the page directory is a table of pointers to page tables. And the page tables, of course, being pointers to physical frames. Um, this actually is used to, a two-level scheme is used to actually um, to save memory, since the, uh, the pa page directory is going to have to be resident. Um, so basically, in this case, our virtual page number is actually divided into two pieces. Um, we have to be able to figure out the index into the page directory so we can locate the correct page table, and then we have to figure out the index into the page table so we can locate the correct page frame. So basically, um, under x86, the upper 10 bits in the virtual address are going to provide your index into the page directory, while the middle 10 bits are going to provide your index into the page table. Um, this slide gets a little bit complicated, but I'm going to give it a go here to try to explain it. Um, basically, there's a number of steps involved in virtual to physical address translation. Um, this is performed by the hardware. The first step is going to be to locate the, um, the page directory, the base address of the page directory in memory. Um, the page directory base is actually located in the case process block. Um, the physical address is also located in CR3, which is the control register on the processor. So basically, the first step is to locate the base of the page directory. Um, the second step is going to be to locate the actual entry in the page directory that contains the pointer to the page table that we need. So basically, we're going to extract the upper 10 bits from the virtual address and use that to add to the page directory base to obtain the entry in the page directory table. Now, the contents of this, this um, page directory entry is basically the uh, a pointer to a page table or the base physical address of the page table in memory. So now at this point, we have the base address of the page table. And now we're trying to get to the PTE, or the entry in the page table. So to get to the page table entry, now we do the same type of thing. We take the middle 10 bits of the virtual address and use that to add to the base address of the page table. And we now get the actual page table entry, which is going to contain the pointer to the page frame in physical memory. So now at this point, we have a pointer to the page frame. And we're actually looking for some byte within that frame. So it's finally at this point that the actual byte index comes in, and we add that to the base address of the physical frame to actually resolve the full physical address. Um, like we said earlier, the, um, the physical memory may be smaller than the amount of virtually addressable memory you have. So therefore, the OS may need to move some pages from main memory out to the disk to satisfy current memory demands. Um, basically, when the OS does this, it marks the PTE for the, the page in question as invalid, writes it out to the disk, and the next time that page is accessed, it's going to generate a page fault. Um, a page fault is basically just an interrupt 
that it's going to cause a vector to an interrupt service routine, which in this case is going to be the page fault handler. Um, there are actually several conditions where a page fault can occur. Um, the most common condition is going to be the case where the page table entry is marked invalid and that page ha has been swapped out to the disk and needs to be brought in. Um, there's a little caveat to that because not only does the PTE need to be marked invalid, that entry cannot be present inside the TLV or the hardware cache of virtual to physical mappings. Um, this becomes very important later on. Um, the second situation where you can have a memory protection violation is going to be um, basically user mode code attempting to access kernel memory or perhaps um, an attempt to write to memory that's marked as read-only. Um, for all of you guys that I lost on that previous slide, a virtual to physical translation, um, I have a little bit clearer one that shows the whole page fault path. Um, 
uh, which significantly increases performance. Um, this is just a simple example of the uh, of, a, of a TLB search. Basically, the TLB um, is a cache. It consists of two parts. You have a tag, which in this case is going to be the virtual page number, and then you have the corresponding frame that maps to that virtual page number in the data in the data section of the uh, of the cache line. So basically, when a memory reference occurs, the TLB tags are going to be searched in parallel to see if they can find a match on that virtual page number. If they can, the data or the corresponding physical frame mapping is going to be returned. In this case, uh, we had a TLB hit on virtual page 17, and its corresponding frame is 84. So basically here I have an illustration of the, um, of the memory access path that includes the TLB. Uh, we're also going to stick with the um, x86 architecture, which actually has a split TLB. So that means that on a memory access, code accesses are going to be checked in the ITLB. So in this case, um, we have a hit on the ITLB. We now have the corresponding frame, which is 132, and we can go directly out to physical memory. In this case, as you can see, since we had a TLB hit, we were able to completely bypass the page tables. Um, it may be possible that we don't have a TLB hit. We could get a miss. Um, and what's even worse than a miss, now that we have to go out to the page, page tables, now we might actually get a page fault, which will kill performance even further. So in this case, our memory access is a code access. It goes out to the ITLB, searches it, it's not there, so now we have a miss. So now we have to go out to the page tables. In this case, we go out to the page tables, and we find something we need is not present. So we have a page fault. Now the OS page fault handler has to be invoked. It has to go out to the disk, bring that frame into memory, and finally mark that, that PTE as being present before the, the, uh, the, the access can be completely resolved. So basically, we have three memory access types. Everyone's familiar with this. We have read, write, and execute. Um, unfortunately, a little caveat to the x86 architecture is we actually only have two memory access types. We actually have read-execute and read-write-execute. By that, I mean the execute access is implied to all memory. Um, this poses a slight problem. In some cases, we might like to actually differentiate between execute access and read-write access. Um, one common case, one common place where this might be the case would be the implementation of non-executable memory. Um, this is used as a um, buffer overflow protection scheme. Um, basically, you know, you have your stack space, which is typically readable and writable. I mean, you store data on the stack. But normally, the stack does not contain executing code unless a buffer overflow attack is in progress. So therefore, heuristically, if we were able to detect an execute access over a read-write access on the stack, we could say if we detect an execute, that heuristically there's a good probability that we're, we're in progress with buffer overflow attack. Um, now the little, th the little caveat here is, like we said, uh, x86 doesn't let us to distinguish between read-write and execute. So basically, um, we have not had hardware support up to this point. We do now have some hardware support, but previously um, there was a project called PAX. Basically, PAX implemented read-write-no-execute or non-executable memory semantics using strictly software support. This was before there was any hardware support for non-executable memory. Um, Windows XP Service Pack 2 and Server 2003 Service Pack 1 now also implement software support in the form of what Microsoft calls Data Execution Prevention, or DEP. Um, as a side note, hardware support has been added for non-executable memory on the 64-bit processors, um, as well as the Pentium 4. Well, in the case of a rootkit, um, it's also kind of advantageous to be able to distinguish between executable and, and, and read-write access to a range of memory. Um, basically, we're going to uh, take an offensive stance on the PAX technology, which 
it's been around for a while. This technique's been around for a while, but so far it hasn't really been shown how you could invert that technique for malicious purposes. So basically, we want to hide code. So we want to differentiate between read, write, and execute. So the idea is, if we have a read access of the code section of our rootkit driver, for example, that's going to be a very strong heuristic that a scanner is trying to locate us. So basically what we would want to do in that case is we want our rootkit code to run, but if a scanner tries to read it, we want to basically return an image of that memory that is does not contain the rootkit code or contain something clean, if it's in the case of a modification to the operating system. So basically what we're proposing here is we're going to do an implementation that is the inverse of PAX. That is, it's an implementation of execute allowed, but diverted read-write memory semantics. Um, we're going to use the, uh, the PAX technique that, that PAX discovered to implement non-executable memory, but in this case we're going to use it to hide a rootkit. So like I said, it's not, the technique is not totally new, but the application um, is somewhat new. So basically there's three implementation issues here. First, we need a way to filter, execute, and read-write accesses, step one. Second, we need a way to fake the read-write accesses once we detect them. Obviously, we don't want the scanner to receive the correct data when it, when it reads our rootkit memory. Lastly, we need to ensure that performance is not adversely affected. Um, obviously, this would not be a viable solution if when we install our rootkit, the uh, system administrator notices that his machine is suddenly running really, really slow. So, to solve the first, the first problem, basically, um, we said earlier that if, a, if we mark the PTE as invalid, the next memory access that occurs to that page is going to generate a page fault. So basically, that means that we can track memory accesses by marking their page table entries as invalid and basically hooking the page fault handler and replacing the operating system's page fault handler. Um, in the actual page fault handler, we have access to, to some interesting information. Um, and we have the saved instruction pointer. We also have the virtual address where the fault occurred. So therefore, if our instruction pointer equals the address of where the fault occurred, we can say that this was an execute access. Otherwise, it's going to be a read-write access. Um, there's one important thing to note here, and that is the fact that our memory hook for the rootkit has to work safely with the operating system's memory management, because the operating system's resolving page faults all the time. So that means, in practical terms, that if we're going to mark pages not present to capture memory accesses, then we also must be able to distinguish whether those memory accesses are a result of someone trying to access the hidden page or a result of normal operating system paging activity. Um, in order to satisfy that, we actually impose two constraints. Um, the first constraint could be that pages are, that are hidden are required to be a non-paged memory. That means there's no possibility that the OS could page that file out to the disk. Um, the second constraint could be if you're using pageable memory, that you use an operating system API to lock it down. So once, once you're able to detect execute from read-write, well now concerns the issue of, well, how are we actually going to fake the read-write acce um, read accesses? So basically, um, this is the technique that was shown in PAX that it used to implement the inverse of what we're going to talk about, and that is we're going to desynchronize the hardware caches, the TLBs. Um, like I said, the x86 has two of them. It has one for code, which is searched on execute. It has one for data, which is searched on read-write. So therefore, a memory access, under normal situation, the ITLB is going to contain the virtual page number and the corresponding physical frame, and the DTLB is going to contain the same thing. So in this case, for virtual page number 12, we see it maps to frame 2. For the DTLB, it also maps to frame 2. Under normal situations, read, write, and execute, they all map to the same physical frame. However, what if we could desynchronize them? What if we could have the ITLB to actually map off to a different physical frame than the DTLB? 
So basically the idea here is that the ITLB contains a pointer to a frame which contains the rootkit code, and the DTLB contains a pointer to the frame which either has a clean copy of something or some random garbage, which is not the rootkit code. So um, basically, since all these translations are performed at the hardware level, this is going to be transparent to the application program, to the kernel driver, or even to the operating system. Um, so basically, once, once we've decided that we're going to desynchronize the TLBs, the question is, well, how do you actually do this? Um, TLBs are almost entirely hardware controlled. Um, however, there is a little bit of support for software control, um, which in this case happens to be enough support to implement this. Um, first of all, we have the capability to flush the TLB. Um, basically, we can flush the entire TLB by reloading register CR3. This normally occurs on a context switch. Um, on a context switch, typically, CR3 will be reloaded, which ends up flushing the entire TLB, except for global entries, which will remain in the TLB. This is more mainly a, uh, a performance enhancement for, uh, for operating system components, which will remain resident at all times. Um, set also, we also have a method of not only flushing the entire TLB, but of flushing an individual entry in the TLB. Um, that would be the invalidate page instruction. Um, so now that we've established that we can flush the TLB, how about loading it? Um, it is possible, actually, to load the TLBs separately, which means that actually executing a data access loads the DTLB, but not the ITLB. Conversely, executing a call loads the ITLB, but not the DTLB. So therefore, it is possible to discreetly load the two TLBs separately and desynchronize them. So basically, our proof of concept implementation consists of two main components. We have the memory hook engine, which has a hook installation component, which sets up the hook, and then a custom page call handler, which um, basically is responsible for filtering, execute, and read-write accesses and correctly uh, manually loading up the right TLB. Um, also, we have a, our second component is going to be a modified FU rootkit. So basically, we've modified um, Jamie's rootkit to, uh, to work in collusion with our Shadow Walker. So basically, on memory hook installation, uh, there are several steps that have to be performed. First of all, since we're going to mark pages not present, we need to install a new page fault handler. Once we've done that, on a, on a page fault, we're going to need to be able to determine relatively quickly if that, if that fault is due to one of our hidden pages being accessed or if it's due to the actual operating system performing um, normal paging activity. So in order to do that, we just insert that page into a simple hash table so we can perform a quick lookup. Um, next, we mark the page not present. Um, and then the last step is really the most important here because we said that the TLB is first on the memory access path, which means that a page fault is generated, one, when the PTE is marked present, but like I said earlier, two, when that entry is not present in the TLB. So therefore, we perform an explicit flush of that page that we're hiding. This means that on the next memory access, we will be able to uh, generate a page fault. Um, if you could please hold your questions to the end, we'll have time for questions. So um, basically, the custom page fault handler's main responsibility is to filter, read, write, and execute accesses for hooked pages. Um, if it determines that the page is not a hooked page, meaning it's just a normal operating system page fault, it passes it down to the OS handler. Um, if it is a page fault due to a hidden page, it's either going to manually load the ITLB or manually load the DTLB, depending upon the type of access. Um, most memory references will be resolved via the TLB path. So intuitively, you would think that you would be generating a lot of page faults. You would take a big hit in performance. Not the case, because we're using the hardware caching mechanism. We're just simply desynchronizing it. Um, so basically, we will still have page faults, but the page faults are not as many as you would think, since the, uh, the TLB path will handle most of the memory references. Um, page faults on the hook pages will, of course, occur on the first execute or data access to the page. Remember, we had to flush it, flush the TLB when we instantiated the hook. 
Um, it will occur on a TLB cash line eviction. So um, it's possible that, that the mapping for that hook page got evicted from the TLB. Well, the next time that a memory access occurs, it will now generate a page fault, which the page fault handler will now reload the correct mapping into the TLB, and that memory access will go through. Um, likewise, the last case would be on an explicit TLB flush context switch if the, uh, if the global bit has not been enabled. So basically here we have some really rudimentary page fault handler pseudocode for what's going on. Um, so basically, we are only hiding kernel pages right now. So we're going to disregard user land accesses. So in the page fault handler, we want this to be as efficient as possible, so we don't want to tie things up if we're not interested in handling this fault. So the first thing we do is we just check if the processor mode is in user mode. If it is, we pass it down. We're not dealing with user mode. Um, if the faulting address is a, is a user page, we're also going to pass it down because we don't hook user pages. Um, in contrast, if the, if the fault is from a hidden page, now we're going to check if it's a read-write or an execute. Um, if it's an execute, we're going to jump over to, uh, to load the ITLB. If it's a data access, we're going to jump over to the load DTLB code. Um, basically, in the load ITLB, what we're going to do is we're going to basically replace that physical frame information in the PTE with the mapping for the um, actual physical frame that contains the rootkit code, because we want it to execute. Um, we're going to temporarily mark that PTE as present to allow the memory access to go through. We're going to perform a call into the page, which is going to load up the ITLB. And I should note here, I forgot to put this on the previous page, <coughs> that we do have to perform a call. So basically that means that we need to find an empty byte in our hidden page that we can insert a return off code to. Um, in, in practice, if you're going to hide sections, say, in a driver, those are PE sections. Um, so therefore, there's going to be some um, alignment. So therefore, there's normally some empty space in there. So you shouldn't really have trouble finding one byte that you can just patch or return into. Um, so therefore, basically, we just make a call to this, uh, to this point in the page where the return has been patched. And it returns control back to the page fault handler and in, in, in process loads up the ITLB. Finally, the, uh, the PTE is marked as non-present again, so we can catch subsequent accesses. Um, we also replace the, uh, the frame back with the original innocent-looking frame, and we go ahead and we return back to the faulting application, or driver as the case may be, without passing down to the OS. The OS doesn't need to have any knowledge of this page fault. Um, if it's a DTLB load, basically the steps are a little bit simpler because by default um, we're going to maintain the clean mapping in the, uh, in the PTE. So therefore we just mark it present, um, perform a read access, and then mark it not present again. And then of course return without passing down to the OS. So um, basically all this information so far concerns how you would hide executable code. How are we doing that? Okay, um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and skip this section on data hiding. Um, the slide should be available probably on rootkit.com within the next week or so. So basically, I'm going to move ahead, and we're just going to talk a little bit about the rootkit here. Um, the rootkit is, of course, the object that we are, uh, we are implementing this process on to actually hide it. Um, it's proof of concept. It doesn't really do anything malicious. It just hides processes. Um, it runs as a system thread. Um, it has no dependence upon user land initialization, um, so which means it has no symbolic link or no functional device in the driver. And also, basically, we envision this rootkit as being an in-memory rootkit, meaning that ideally it would be installed via a kernel-level exploit. Obviously, if this rootkit driver is sitting on the disk, we open up a whole new can of worms for detection and basically invalidate all these stealthy things that we're trying to do. So basically, we never want it to reside on the disk. This is a perfectly reasonable thing if we consider attacking, say, a server system, which is infrequently rebooted. Chances are high that this rootkit will sit in memory, and by the time we come back, it'll still be there. So lastly, the impact on system performance. Like we said, modern TLBs have high hit rates. That means most translations will be resolved via the TLB and not the page fault path, um, which means 
that we're going to have a very little performance hit. Um, I can't speak from a from a, uh, a, a performance metric point of view here because we haven't really done any rigorous testing on performance. But I can say that subjectively speaking, hiding um, Jamie's rootkit with this. Uh, Shadow Walker memory hook engine, there is no subjective noticeable performance impact. Um, clearly, the performance impact will probably vary depending upon the number of pages you're having to hide. Um, in this case, hiding a kernel driver, how many pages you really have. You have four or five sections in a PE, portable executable, so chances are you only have four or five pages. If they're page aligned, four or five pages is, is really negligible. Um, so for small, small numbers of pages, we haven't observed any performance impact at all. Um, as this is not really a weaponized attack tool, there are a number of uh, known limitations. Um, Jamie and I have done this basically on our spare time. So uh, basically we've not implemented a uh, fully productized or weaponized version. Um, so first of all, there's no PAE support. PAE basically extends um, addressability from 32 to 36 bits. Um, we don't support that yet. There's no hyper-threading or multi-processor support. There's clear issues with regards to uh, synchronization problems involved with porting this up to a uh, multi-processor system. We've not addressed those yet. Um, currently, we only hide 4K-sized kernel pages. Um, we are theoretically capable of hiding 4 megabyte pages. The x86 architecture actually has two page sizes, 4K and 4 megabyte. Um, the main point of interest with the 4 megabyte pages are going to be hiding of NTOS kernel, which is sitting on a 4 megabyte page, obviously an interest to a rootkit developer who wants to install his uh, hooks into the operating system kernel. Um, currently, we can't hide NTOS kernel. There's some um, technical difficulties with that, which we're working to resolve. But it's quite effective for hiding drivers and other drivers, such as maybe Indus, which sit in, um, in the 4K page range. So we could hide things, hooks in the, uh, the network drivers, for example. Um, as far as detection, I'm going to go over this real, real brief. I think we're really running out of time here. Um, first of all, uh, we, like we said earlier, we have to make the constraint that, um, that we have non-paged memory that we're marking non-present. So we don't conflict with the, uh, so we can differentiate our page faults from OS page faults. Obviously, non-present pages in non-page memory are heuristically abnormal. If that's su sufficient to indicate that a rootkit's installed, highly debatable, but it's still abnormal. Um, obviously, the page fault handler code itself cannot be marked not present, um, because that would imply that we're marking the page containing the page fault handler as not present. We would end up with lots of recursive problems of recursive reentry. Um, therefore, the solution for hiding the page fault handler, we have to fall back to more tried and true approaches. Um, it's small, there's, uh, it's written in assembly, there's no APIs. So, you know, polymorphism seems like a fairly reasonable solution to that problem. Um, likewise, it's also difficult to conceal hooks on the IDT. Currently, this proof of concept makes no effort to conceal the IDT hooks. Yes, this rootkit is very easily detected right now because of this, but that was not really our goal. We're just showing a, uh, a proof of concept. So right now, we're really running short, so I'm going to proceed to the demo and, uh, and skip the last couple of slides. Um, I know we're late, so if anyone has you know, any other engagements, feel free to head on out. But I am going to go ahead and perform the demo for anyone that's interested. Um, I'm going to do a GUI version of this demo. I have a, a, a hardcore soft ice version if anyone wants to see after the, after the talk. So um, basically the first thing I'm going to do is right now I'm using a driver monitor. It's a tool with, uh, with the soft ice driver suite. It allows you to load a kernel driver. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and load up um, Jamie's rootkit, FU. go. Our um, driver is started successfully. So um, now if we enter soft ice, we can get the um, base address of where this driver is loaded in memory.
So this is um, this is the virtual address of where this driver is loaded in memory. We're going to go ahead and dump it, dump the memory at that address. So for all of you guys that um, use hex dumps all the time, this should look pretty familiar. This 4D5A, that's simply the MZ signature inside the um, PE header. So right now what we're seeing is the PE header of this rootkit driver loaded in memory. So now at this point, I'm going to go ahead and load up the memory hook engine, Shadow Walker. Okay, so it started up successfully. So now we're going to go ahead and perform another memory dump. Well, now it's gone. So we'll take questions offline. We're leaving the room. We're being evicted. We have swag books. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot.